think yeah, the hundred seventy five billion dollars was a good idea because a number of years later people still talk about it. <laughs> so I would like to start off with stating a conflict of interest. I am a walker, so my presentation will not be an objective presentation. So if we look at it, let's say each presentation needs a title slide. And this was a picture that I took, I think a few years ago, and I think it was in Qingdao in, uh, in, in China. And actually you see, now let me figure out whether I do it in the right way. Uh, if you look here, this is actually a beautiful sidewalk. There's only a problem. There are a lot of cars on the sidewalk. So this is something, obviously, that we should keep in mind, that building sidewalks is one thing, but actually using sidewalks for walking is another thing. Now, after all these beautiful slides uh, that we saw before, here's an entirely incorrect PowerPoint slide. They always say, don't put too much text and make certain that you have pictures. <laughs> I wanted to read this with you. If we read it carefully, it says, the pedestrian has the right of the road. The chauffeur who thinks that because he gives warning of his approach, he is entitled to the road, is utterly and entirely wrong. He comes after the pedestrian and even after the man on the bicycle. It is not the pedestrian who must get out of the way of the automobile, but the automobile must get out of the road of the pedestrian, even if he is standing still. So, I was thinking, like, if you need a summary in terms of recommendations for your conference, I think this is a pretty nifty summary. But I think it's important, like, if we start thinking, who said this? And we put this question out on Twitter yesterday, and there was one person who already knew it. But anybody in the room who is, it was a couple of years ago uh, that it was said. But what is, what is important, it was not an NGO. It was not an academic. It was not a consultant. It was a politician who said this. And this was said by the Prime Minister of Ontario Province in 1910 in Parliament in Canada. And I checked it, this is a politician with a conservative background. This is not a liberal, <laughs> this is a conservative. So, just imagine a Prime Minister of a province in Canada, and we saw some of the examples what's happening as well in Canada from, from Earl, but just imagine a prime minister standing up and making this kind of statement. Just imagine the chief executive in Hong Kong standing up and saying, the pedestrian has the right of way. That is something that I think that we would all aspire to. And this was happening in a time in Canada that you actually, let me see it. This is the road. And what's the nice thing on the picture? The sidewalk. This is, wait a moment. Here we have a situation where the money is not being spent on the roads, but the money was actually spent on the sidewalk. So that also helps to explain why the Prime Minister of Ontario said that in those days. But I think political leadership is absolutely key. And I think we need to really define political leadership if we want to make progress. It is very encouraging and it's absolutely vital to hear the chief executive say that Hong Kong is, uh, is promoting walkability and is creating a, a, a policy of access. But there is a difference between promoting walking and actually stating the legal rights of the pedestrian and to prioritize these over the, the cars. And I think that that's something that we need to make and keep in mind. The next thing, two more pictures. Like, this is another sidewalk, this time no cars. Uh, but 
and then another picture. So let me see, we had this situation, this is in Tokyo, and this is in Delhi. So this is a, what is the difference between these two pictures? So, the one had a beautiful sidewalk, and the other does not have a sidewalk. So, if you look at it, here well designed and constructed and maintained sidewalks, and here we have poorly designed and non maintained sidewalks. Let's say a very short summary. Here we have people in suits, and here we have people in saris. So, it the mindset of society is like you could say that each society ultimately gets the sidewalks that the status minded people in society like to see. And so on the one hand we have political leadership and on the other hand we have mindset. And I think like when we were talking to the people in India and we say what if what if you would be able to get, let's say, people in suits walking through here for a month every morning and every afternoon? Would they start to do something about this? Eh? And a lot of people in India said, well, I think there's a good chance that something would be done. And I think that that, that symbolizes really a key difference. So political leadership and what is happening in society. So now let's move to the international level because that is why I was asked uh, to, to speak. And this is, let's see, how do you make drying paint interesting for a audience of activists on walking? So this is, let's say, a huge amount of UN speak, uh, lots of UN global agreements and which we think are terribly important and we think that ultimately they are going to help you in your work on walking. So let me take you through this. So and the interesting thing was like because I think that Maureen spoke about how uh, a number of years ago suddenly everybody, everybody started to do something and that is how it all came together here in this conference. Like, our organization, the Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport, started in 2009 and we had this lofty, ambitious idea and we say like, if only people at the global level talk about sustainable transport, then all the work of the people like Civic Exchange, of Walk21 and all of these organizations will become a lot easier. And we thought that it was terribly ambitious. But we have now, if you look at it, on this slide we see six global processes which have all come to fruition or which all have been renewed over the last two years and we actually start to see now that at the global level there is an agenda which is promoting sustainable transport and so what we're saying is in, oh, oh, oh. in summary what we're saying is the global process on sustainable development and climate change present the transport sector with opportunities and responsibilities. And I'll say more about that book. First, we have the Global Decade of Action on Road Safety. And I heard and I saw some tweets about what was say, being said in several of the, of the breakout sessions this morning. Road safety is a global problem. Each year, 1.3 million people die. Literally die. 1.3 million people. So that means throughout the duration of this conference that we will have about 15,000 people dying in traffic accidents. In addition to that, for each person that dies in traffic, there are about five to six who are seriously injured. So, and then I think that what is very well known is that pedestrians are most at risk. So this is a global agreement. If we are able to take action on road safety, we are able to improve the situation of the pedestrians. 
So, the global agreement, and it's a very, like, which is the country who promoted this? Russia. You would not expect that Russia is a leader on sustainable transport, but we have friends in many places. You could also say friends in strange places, but we say friends in many places. But, so they agreed, they pulled the global community together in 2010 and said, we need to do something about it. And they said, we're going to halve the number of people being killed in road accidents. Last year, in 2015, they had a meeting in Brasilia and they said, how are we doing? And unfortunately, the news was not very good. We are behind implementing this target, but it is important. It is an important driver and we should capitalize on this. The second thing is, uh, is financing. We all know that if we talk about improving uh, the, the infrastructure for, for pedestrians, we're talking about funding. And we need to talk about how do we change the mindset of the people who do the transport budgets. So this conference is a conference which takes place every eight to ten years. And the idea is that we say, how as a global community are we funding development? And so in this meeting in Ethiopia last year in Addis Ababa, they, they adopted the, the Addis Ababa action agenda on financing for development. And one of the key concepts in this outcome document there was sustainable infrastructure. And they say like, we will need infrastructure. And I think it's important to realize what was being said, I think, by Anthony Chow uh, about the urban population increasing. Up to 2050, we're going to add 2.3 billion people to the urban population. 2.3 billion. That's roughly equivalent to the current population of India and China combined. Those people will need to go to, to work. Their children need to go to school. They want to go to theaters. They want to go to parks. And in order to do that, we need transport. And we need to build the infrastructure and the transport services. So to do that, we will need funding. And sustainable, uh, sustainable infrastructure is a key concept there. Then we have the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Who in the room is familiar with the abbreviation MDGs? Raise your hand if you know what MDGs was about. It seems that we will need to do some explanation. <laughs> I thought I could take a shortcut. <laughs> but, uh, okay, the year 2000, we went from one millennium to the other millennium. And they said, the global leader said, it is a disgrace that so many people still live in poverty, that so many people live in slums, uh, that they don't have access to health care. And we, as a global community, need to take action on that. And the leaders of the world agreed on a set of development goals. These became the Millennium Development Goals. They were related to health, to social issues, and one environmental goal. And these started to influence government policy at the national level and at the, at the local level. So when, and these goals were for a 15 year period. So at this conference, uh, which took place in Rio in 2012, and I think that was being referred to in the introduction, they, the, the leader said, we need to come up with a successor to the Millennium Development Goals. And that became the Sustainable Development Goals. And they said, at that time, the leaders from the countries of the developing world said, it's not enough to talk and to have goals on social issues. We also need to have goals on how we are going to generate the wealth in order to be able to undertake these social activities. And so based on that, we now have 17 goals. After we secured the $175 billion in, in Rio, we said, well, we're in a good shape now. Now we can also ask for an SDG for transport because we actually come with the money. So we had a meeting with 15 countries in New York, in the UN, and they said to us, not so fast. Huh? 
They said transport is so important that it should not have an SDG of its own. Instead, he says, you need to be mainstreamed through all the other SDGs. Eh? Because we cannot accomplish the SDG on energy, on water, on education, if we do not have better transport. So what we currently see is that amongst these SDGs, that there are seven out of the 17 SDGs which have transport-related targets. Eh? And especially uh, the Sustainable Development Goal on Cities is very relevant for the pedestrian community because it talks actually about access to public transport and it talks about public space, so I think it's very important. Then we have the, another important one, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Who has heard of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change? This is, uh, this is exactly why we think that it is so important. Uh, because the political momentum is with the climate change discussion. What does the Paris Agreement say? The Paris Agreement says that we should limit the temperature in, uh, increase to 6 degrees, 4 degrees, 2 degrees, or less than 2 degrees. Less than two. And this is one of the most fascinating things that I've experienced in my career. We went to Paris hmm, as a transport community and we had done our homework and we said two degrees hmm, is very ambitious and we don't think that we can do it. And the same thing was being said in the energy community and in the building community. So people went there and said, well, first of all, we need to see whether we get an agreement. And secondly, two degrees is very ambitious. And then something very interesting happened. There was one gentleman, the foreign minister of the Marshall Islands, Tony Brun. And he said, if we realize and if we are able to achieve this so-called ambitious target of two degrees, half of our country will be gone. And that started to resonate. Eh? And you started to see that political leaders actually took the responsibility that they have as political leaders. And they came up with an agreement. And they say, two degrees is not enough. We're going to well below one and a half degrees. Eh? And so for all of you who think that international conferences are a waste of time, that they are talk shops, I think that this is a living proof that you can have a global conference which is changing lives. And I think if you look at it, the transport community, the energy community, the building community, we are all scrambling this year. Because what does that mean? In the case of transport, we have a relatively simple answer. We need to take carbon out of transport. We need to decarbonize transport. And we need to do that roughly around 2050 to 2070. So that means that we are at the beginning of the biggest transformation in the transport sector that we have seen since the introduction of motorized transport. Let's assume that the retirement age in 2070 or 2050 is going to be 70 years. So that means that we're talking about something which is how many years, Bronwyn, you're calculating already? How many years is that from now? So those of you who is, uh, let's say, 30, 40 years, who is younger than 35? Raise your hands. Huh? Yeah, yeah, we have, we have a number of people. Eh? So it's, it's up to you. Like it's literally, we are putting our fate in your hands. Because a lot of us will be retired well before that. But like you, your professional careers need to be dominated by let's say, the outcome of the Paris Agreement. And it's, it's really like your, 
let's say our generation, we were excited because we were the, ex uh, the generation which, which went through the computers and that we, we, instead of writing everything by hand, we put things in the computer. Like, you are part of the generation which is going to change the face of transport. And if we listen to Earl's presentation, also you will change the face of cities. And you will change the way that cities operate. So this is a very important agreement. I think that, first this one, the Habitat 3 conference. Like, I always joke that, that I say this is my favorite type of conference. And the reason is that it's only organized once every 20 years. <laughs> so those of you who are younger than 35, you can at least go twice to this conference. <laughs> but the reason is that they say, like, from time to time, it is important that the global community comes together and decides what do we want to do with the cities of the world. And they say, like, in many cases, the agenda on cities is not a standalone agenda by itself, but it is an agenda which is influenced by the road safety, by finance, by sustainable development, by trade, by climate. And they say we take stock and we interpret this in the context of the urban agenda. And this conference, we are very fortunate that with having the SDGs uh, last year, and having these conferences, that this conference is now going to take place in two weeks from now. So we will be, very uh, a number of us will be in Quito, in Ecuador, in two weeks from now, and to see like how do we take all of these messages coming out of these conferences and how do we take them, uh, how do we take them to Quito? I'm skipping for for time's sake the the trade, but trade is important as well, and there's there's linkage with sustainable development there as well. But so then I'll skip this as well because this is what we are doing as the slow cut partnership to influence all these uh, processes. And maybe just one, uh, we are very happy to see that the current Secretary General, uh, Ban Ki-moon, has turned out to be a very strong champion for sustainable transport. One week before we had this conference in Rio where this money was pledged, we organized a bike ride with the Secretary General in New York. It was only 200 meters, but it's important. And, and the Secretary General did not take part because he had broken his hand playing soccer, but, but he was there uh, to wave us off and, and he spoke to us and says that it is important. So, but we do see, as a consequence of that, that the Secretary General set up a high-level advisory group on sustainable transport in order to get advice from the experts what the UN should be doing. And this report will be released in two weeks. So, we sat watching paint dry. <laughs> like it's, and it's not just one little piece of paint. Like it's, uh, you have paint. Let's say this is the habitat process. So, if you want to influence a global process, it's, uh, you need to first study the process. The process started uh, roughly around, I think, a year and a half or two years ago. And it started off with an assessment of national reports, regional reports, issue papers, policy units, regional and thematic events. So then uh, they came up with a zero draft outcome document. Then they had discussions in New York at various places. Then they had conferences in uh, a conference in Surabaya. And that ultimately ends up with the outcome document, the new urban agenda. So what we have been doing together with our 90 members uh, is that we have been trying to influence this process. How do we make certain that this new urban agenda truly reflects the importance of sustainable transport, as is also articulated in these other processes? Eh? And we are happy to say that we have been quite successful. Like, just by the count of it, transport is mentioned 30 times, mobility is mentioned 21 times, connectivity is mentioned seven times, and unfortunately, <laughs> there is still scope for improvement. <laughs> uh, walking is mentioned once, but I decided to share with you what do they say about walking, and then you will see that we are actually coming almost full circle to where we started with the Prime Minister of Ontario. 
We will promote access for all to safe, age and gender responsive, affordable, accessible and sustainable urban mobility and land and sea, and, and sea transport systems. You can clearly see this is a compromise statement. <laughs> uh, enabling meaningful participation in social and economic activities in cities and human settlements. And I think that that was the element that Earl was making. Yes, transport is not done for the sake of transport, but you're doing this in the context of providing access to, to meaningful activities. And we will do this by integrating transport and mobility plans into overall urban and territorial plans and promoting a wide range of transport and mobility options, in particular through supporting a significant increase in accessible, safe, efficient, affordable and sustainable infrastructure for public transport. It's a pity, but if somebody could communicate to the chairman of MTR that, that we are actually looking after the interest of, of MTR as well. But, and then, let's say, as well as non-motorized options such as walking and cycling, and you see walking is mentioned before cycling, prioritizing them over private motorized transportation. So you see that there is a willingness, and this is also a negotiated outcome document uh, where governments have, uh, have sat together uh, through all of these different meetings. And as an outcome, they still say walking is important, public transport is important, and we are prioritizing this over. Uh, and we were actually quite surprised to see that this language stayed in until the end. In the past, it would have been a question that they would have, they would have stopped, uh, let's say, after the word cycling. And that this idea, like this political statement, and say that we're prioritizing this, I think that that is a major step forward. And I think it shows that there is a willingness to, to actually go beyond the business as usual. And that people realize that what we truly need at this moment is what we call transformative change. Other people say we need the Big Bang. But what is clear is that incremental change is not going to deliver these global goals. Incremental change will not deliver the 2 degree, let alone the 1.5 degree scenarios. And I think that we now have a global narrative which supports this idea of transformative change, actually, I think it makes you somewhat hopeful and that you think that, that we can make use of that. And I think that that is, and I think that Jim spoke about it in his opening remarks, on whether Walk 21 should make this bridge to the, to the global processes. Like it is clear that you have a very strong, you have a very powerful ally in these global processes. So the question is, how do you utilize this in order to advance this? For those of you who will be in Quito, uh, we very much welcome you uh, on the 19th of October, when we are going to have uh, a special day of transport in, in Quito, but also to give you an idea of how popular, or let's say, uh, how effective we have been is currently the latest count is that we have about 28, uh, that not we, but there will be 28 events on transport during the five days of, of the Habitat Conference. And we are also, I think that uh, we are working at the moment with you and Habitat, which is the key organization, and then see how can we track all of this. So in summary, global processes are complicated, but global processes can be very useful. And I think that global processes increasingly are positioned in such a way that they can actually accelerate the, 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 the objectives that all of us have in this room, which is how do we get people walking. With that, I still have 28 seconds. Thank you. <laughs>